Grab your Bibles, if you would. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Last week, uh, we began talking about some spiritual warfare. And we saw in this spiritual warfare that we are under attack and that God has given us the necessary tools that we need to fight that battle. And so he says multiple times there to stand and to put on the armor of God. And in setting that up today, we're going to put on the armor of God here in Ephesians chapter 6. So look there with me. We will begin in verse 14. There it says, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist. He starts off in this passage, there's this one main command to stand to stand firm, to withstand. We don't tuck tail and run when we face spiritual warfare. Now, when we face temptation, the Bible says to flee temptation. But when we face this spiritual warfare and this attack, God does not need a bunch of wimpy Christians running away from the fight. He needs soldiers who are going to stand and fight. Now, the rest of this passage, he's going to give us six pieces of armor that we are to have, that we are to use as we fight this spiritual warfare. And what he says here, and it's very key before we get into the the different pieces, but there is a nuance where it says, uh, it says, with truth like a belt around your waist. Uh, That's a good translation, but literally there, there is a participle that means having girded yourself with truth. That means that all of these pieces of armor are all already on you before you ever get to the battle. You do not wait for the battle to begin and then you start putting it on. These are things that you should have on all of the time. Now, this first one we know is the belt of truth, the belt of truth. The the Bible here says, with truth like a belt around your waist. Literally, it says, to gird yourself with truth. Now, I have on uh, a tunic. This would be called a tunic, just basically a, uh, a sheet that they cut a couple of holes in is what a tunic would have been. As you can see, it looks like a dress. I don't have a lot of experiences. Where I don't have any experience wearing a dress, all right? <laughs> Maybe I should say it that way. But you can imagine that if you are trying to fight, you're trying to move, uh, you're in hand-to-hand combat, you can imagine that having all of this material would be a detriment to you trying to move around. And so he says that you are to gird yourself with truth using this belt. So I've got a belt on. Uh, The soldier would have had a thick leather belt. This is just kind of a cloth belt, but it's going to serve the purpose. I'm going to try to do what they would have done, and uh, you just kind of bear with me. So they would have taken, by the way, I've got some stuff on underneath this, okay? Just wearing some jeans underneath here. I I don't need to show off my chiseled legs. I don't want any of you to be envious or to lust today at church, all right? So so what they would have done is they would have taken this, they would have taken the backside of their uh, tunic and this front part that was hanging down, and they would take this, and they'd hack this up here and hack that up there, and they would bring this, and they would tuck it in this belt. I'm going to try my best, all right? We're on TV here, so y'all at home, you know, just be careful. All right, so now I'm all cinched up with this dress. Now I can move around. I'm not worried about tripping over my dress, tripping over my tunic. I'm, I can move around okay. And so here we have the belt of truth. We, the, the thing that holds us all together is truth. Now, the truth that we have here in the Bible uh, is the truth of God's Word. In fact, Jesus himself says that he is the truth. And the idea is that we take all the areas of our life, all that extra cloth, and we cinch it up and we tuck it with the truth of God's Word. If you're taking notes, here's the first piece. To go to war, a Christian must have 
integrity. I'm borrowing a couple of words from the great Adrian Rogers as he was preaching a sermon similar to this. But the first piece of armor you have is integrity. The fact that everything in your life is correlated to the truth of God's Word and the truth of Jesus Christ, your integrity. Now, why do we need integrity to be ready to fight? Remember, who is Satan? Satan is the father of lies. One of the things that he tries to use is deception and lies. And if you are walking in the truth, you will be able to see the deception of Satan very quickly and be able to defend yourself of it. However, if part of your life is in the, a lie or in deception already and it's not in the truth, you do not have that integrity and you will be under attack. He will find that spot and he will attack that spot. And so, my friends, we must make sure that we're living in the truth, that we are living in integrity. The second piece that we have here, look back in your text. He says, there and righteousness like armor on your chest, having put, in, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. All right, I've got my beautiful assistant here to help me. All right. Now, whoever made this did a good job of accurately depicting my physique right here. So <laughs> this guy has a six-pack and an eight-pack on the side, all right? When you have an eight-pack on the side, you know you got something going on, okay? Now, the breastplate would have been some armor over the chest and over the torso. You can imagine why you would need this to protect the, the vital organs in your body cavity. This would protect from any kind of sword or arrow or blow that would come your direction. This would have been kind of fancy having a metal one. Most of them might have a leather covering that they would put over, and they would hang different pieces of metal, sometimes hooves from a horse. They would hang that down just to give it something hard so that a blow would not be direct to the chest. So he's putting on this breastplate and he calls it the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness means that you're right before God, before his standard. When you and I came to Jesus Christ, when we were saved, the Bible says we were declared righteous. We had righteousness imputed to us, and it, God said, you're righteous. You are free of sin. This text is not talking about that. There is also another aspect of righteousness, which is the ongoing lifestyle in obedience to God, the absence of sin in our life. And so when we are to put on a breastplate of righteousness, we are putting on, number two, to go to war, the Christian must have purity, must have purity. When you put on that breastplate of, right, breast, breastplate of righteousness, you are putting on purity, that your life is full of being obedient to Almighty God. Now, why would purity be important? One of the words and names of Satan is diabolos. We saw this last week, translated the devil. Diabolos means the accuser or the slanderer. He does use deception, but he also uses denunciation. He will come and denounce you and say, look at you. Look what you've done. Look who you are. You can't fight for the Lord. You have this sin in your life. And my friends, that will paralyze you and me spiritually if we have unconfessed sin in our life. We won't be able to do anything for the Lord. And so that's why we must put on this breastplate of righteousness, this pure, holy living. Now, if you are not righteous, the Bible says that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The way that you put this on is by having no unconfessed, unrepented sin. When we place this on us, what we're doing is we are protecting ourselves from the attacks of Satan. All right, the third one, it says that we are to have our feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. 
Your feet must be ready. Now, what they would do, I've got some sandals on here, and uh, I'm going to kind of show this to you guys so you can see it, all right? So pray for me that I don't fall over with this uh, thing on. But you see the bottom of these? Y'all see all that little, those little things right there? So these are nails that are nailed into the bottom of this shoe. The shoe would have been leather sole, leather straps, and they would hammer in some nails into the sole of the shoe. Any ideas why you'd need nails there? For traction. They were basically ancient cleats. We use that today in athletics, right? You got a football player. They're going to wear cleats to give them good traction. You think about it. You are fighting. You're in a big line with other soldiers. You're trying to fight, and you need stability. You need your feet to be stable so that when you have an attack, you're not tripping over, falling on the ground. As you're fighting, and I don't want to be too gross here, but there will be blood and other fluids and other things all over the ground as you're fighting. It would get slippery as you're fighting. And so you would need stable feet from which to fight. That's why he says you are to have the stability, and we get this stability, this readiness from the gospel of peace. Now, some take this, and they think about what Paul said in Romans chapter 10, and when he's quoting the Old Testament, and, and it says that how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Y'all remember that passage of scripture? And that is a beautiful picture. However, in this context, we're not talking about bringing good news. We're talking about being ready to fight spiritual warfare. So in this passage of scripture, it's not that we are bringing the good news. It's that we are receiving and living in the light and the context of that good news. Now, the good news of Jesus has multiple different nuances. One of those is the good news of peace. We find earlier in the book of Ephesians that he talks about the gospel being something that brings peace to you and me in relation with Almighty God. The Bible says that while we are sinners, we were enemies of God, and that the good news of Jesus is that he took those who were enemies and reconciled them and made them family. And so when we have the gospel of peace, what it's saying is we have peace with God, but not only does the gospel give us peace with God, but it gives us peace with one another. He talks about the Jew and the Gentile in the book of Ephesians and how the gospel brings peace between those two groups. And we have that peace. Now, why is it that we need this peace? To go to war, a Christian must have tranquility. You must have tranquility. Why is that? Because the devil will attack you through division. He will try to divide and conquer. Many a church has fallen, not because they weren't good people, not because they didn't have a healthy budget and good buildings. Many a church has fallen because Satan was able to divide them and they began to fight against one another instead of fighting against him. Many a church has fallen because of that. When we take our eyes off the main thing, when we are distracted, when we are divided, my friends, we will lose. You cannot fight a battle unless you are at peace with God and peace with one another. Many of us have gone through a season of doubting our salvation. Many of us have gone through a season of being discouraged. And here's what we see, this attack and we don't have peace with God and peace in our heart. And if we don't have peace, we can't fight that battle. So we must have tranquility. And then the next one, it says, we must take up the shield of faith. All right, let's see if we can do this one. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. The shield of faith. Now, in this day and age, they had two types of shields. One would have been a smaller round shield that they would use for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. The other would be a shield that was two foot by four foot, and it was designed to have a whole row of soldiers linking their shields together. Now, this would have been one of those larger shields. Notice in the text, it says, and let me get back to it. What verse are we on? I don't even know. In every situation, take up the shield of faith which you, with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. 
And so what would happen is they would make these shields out of wood. They would wrap them in leather, dip them in water, because as they were fighting, the enemy would shoot arrows. They had dipped the, wrapped the tip with some cloth, dipped it in pitch, set it on fire, would shoot those arrows. Now they could hit you. They could land on the ground. They could catch stuff on fire. But do you know what those things did most of all? they would terrify people. If you are marching in an army and you see flaming arrows in the thousands being shot at you, my friends, you might get a little bit nervous. And so we're to have this shield of faith because when the arrow would hit the shield, it would go through the leather and it would stop at the wood and the wet leather would extinguish the fire. You would see uh, uh, it, it, it would protect them. Now notice it says you take this shield of faith, a shield of faith. Faith could mean a set of doctrines, but in this case, the shield of faith is our trusting in Jesus, our trusting in Christ to provide us. Think about this picture. Arrows are coming. You have the shield here. As long as you stay behind the shield, you're going to be okay. But if you lose faith in the shield and you decide, I got to get out of here, now you expose yourself to the arrow. As long as we have faith in Christ, as the arrows are coming, we will be able to withstand it. We must trust that he can take care of us. And so I will tell you the next thing that you need is this, to go to war, a Christian must have certainty certainty. Satan will attack you with discouragement. He's got nothing. He's been defeated already. All he can do is smoke and mirrors, but he can discourage you to keep you from fighting. He will shoot those arrows to discourage and discourage and discourage. And if you are so discouraged, we can't do that. We can't do that. That can't take place. That's too big for us. We can't handle that. If you have that type of discouraged mentality, if you don't believe you can do it, you don't believe he can do it, then guess what? Can't do it. And so we maintain our faith Trusting the Lord, we have certainty that even though it looks like everything is against us, we're going to keep marching with him. Certainty. The next one is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Is that how you want to do that, brother? All right, you got the helmet of salvation. Now, the helmet of salvation, uh, the helmet was designed, obviously, to protect the head. Uh, you kind of, you don't want the head to get hit with a sword or arrow or any of those kind of things. You kind of want it to stay intact. So it would protect the head. It would protect uh, the neck. Now, he's saying here that the helmet is the helmet of salvation, so when you're talking about salvation, we think immediately about being saved from hell. And that's a good thing to think about, no doubt. So the helmet of salvation is uh, referring, yes, to salvation, but it could also talk about deliverance and then victory. Think about salvation. In the Bible, the Bible talks about salvation as something that is already taking place, something that is taking place, and something that will take place. This idea of salvation, the helmet of salvation, Salvation is that you are protected with the knowledge and with the idea that your salvation is already taken care of. Your salvation is already accomplished. It is guaranteed. Even though you're in the midst of a fight and it seems like it's questionable whether or not God's going to deliver, the promise is that God has already delivered because he has already defeated Satan on Calvary. So to go to war, a Christian must have surety, a guarantee. Satan will attack with doubt. We talked a little bit about doubting your salvation. 
Satan will attack you. You're not really saved. Satan will attack you. God can't really show up. Satan will bring doubts into your life. And our doubts stem from our emotions in certain circumstances. But we do not live by emotions. We live by faith. We live by God's word. And so we can be protected because when we are fighting spiritual warfare, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. We already have won the battle. And the helmet of salvation keeps us fighting. And then one last one, and this is my favorite one. He says we're to take up the sword of the Spirit. Now, don't get any ideas here, Jeff. Thank you, sir. They would have had two swords. Uh, one uh, would have been a large broadsword that you could only swing around with two hands. This was, uh, was a sword that you would, I mean, you would whack somebody with. This one uh, is the smaller sword. It's double-sided. It would have been about this size for hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is the sword that he's describing here. This sword would have been used as a defensive weapon, yes, but it also would have been used as an offensive weapon. So, Terrell, let's show them how this works. Will you come up? No, I'm just joking. I'm kidding. I won't do that to you. Now, the Bible here says that it's the word of God that is the sword. Think about Jesus in the wilderness. When Satan was attacking him, three times Jesus defended himself and took the battle to Satan using what? The word of God. God has given you your sword. The Bible says it is sharper than any double-edged sword separating the bone from the marrow. The word of God is living, it is active, it is your greatest attack. And I would say in order to go to war, a Christian must have tenacity. We must take the fight to them. Satan will try to deflect all God didn't really mean this. Oh, that's not really what that is. Satan will try to deflect, but don't let him do it. Say, the word of God says, the word of God says, the word of God says, and we must be tenacious with that and take the fight to him. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail. Think about that for a minute. Do gates go on attack? No. Gates are a defensive mechanism. The gates of hell is how hell defends itself from God's army. And if the gates of hell cannot stand, it is because we are tenacious and we are taking the fight to them. My friends... We have got to be at war, and we have got to take it to the enemy. Now, I've got to flip a page. <laughs> when Satan uses deception, we have integrity. When Satan tries denunciation, we have purity. When Satan tries division, we have tranquility. When he tries discouragement, we have certainty. When he tries doubt, we have surety. When he tries deflection, we have tenacity. And every single one of these aspects of the armor of God are basically describing Jesus. When you put on the armor of God, you are putting on Jesus. My friends, if he be for us, who can be against us? Bow your heads and hearts for a moment. I'm going to ask you to think about your life. Is your life one of integrity? 
are all the areas of your life being lived in accordance with God's truth or with some other worldview? Is your life one of purity? Is there any unconfessed sin, unrepented sin in your life? Is your life one of tranquility? Are you at peace with God? And are you at peace with others? Is your life one of certainty? Where you're walking by faith and not by sight? Are you living with surety, the guarantee of your salvation? Is your one of tenacity, studying God's word, storing it in your heart, and living by it? Some of you right now are going through a battle, and you may be losing. And the question is, with all of this armor at your disposal, why? Could it be because you haven't been putting it on? For many in this room, you've never given your life to Christ. You're not even equipped with this. And Satan has a field day with you and with your family. What you need to do today is give your life to Jesus Christ and let him arm you for the fight. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the armor that you have given us. Lord, we thank you so much that you've not left us to fight this battle on our own, but that you will fight it through us. And I pray, oh God, that we would be a church who is armed for battle and ready to fight. Lord, I pray for those in here today who are not ready. I pray, oh God, that they would get there. And I pray, Father, that today would be the day that they would take up the armor of God. We give this time of response to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to know more about First Baptist Lafayette, visit our website at fbclaf.org.